Welcome back to the Proceedings Podcast. This is, again, day three of Hook 24, and I've got a bonus guest, uh, an old shipmate of mine, uh, Jim Gigliotti. He's a retired Navy captain, A6 A6, NFL. modern air navigator. Yep, and then uh, yeah. later on, you're... With the new, you, new pipeline. With the new pipeline. Yep. Which uh, carrier did you carry? Harry S. Truman, uh, from 2004 to 2006. It was so, an honor. Yeah. Uh, one That's of the greatest thrills of my life. It was a great lead and great sailors. It was a fun job, and but the, the people made made it happen. Yeah. So. And after you retired from the Navy, you went into industry. Yep. I uh, I left the Navy in 2007. I uh, wanted to go back and work in the industry where I could give back, and I found a spot at Lockheed Martin in Fort Worth. Work on the F-35 program. It was it's been rewarding, and watching a new airplane go from initial development through now IOC first few deployments getting it integrated in the fleet along with our, our legacy aircraft that are very capable still today, the Hornet, the Growler, the E2D, H60, the air wing, basically. Yeah, uh, yeah. And now the F-35 is just another major part of that evolving air wing of the future. So you're the Navy program manager for F-35, which is F-35C. Right. Uh, we were just chatting. There's uh, a West Coast fleet replacement squadron at Lemoore. Yes. Right? And there's yeah. three... Uh, operational squadrons now. Or the fourth, a fourth one is coming online. Yes, we currently have uh, the the FRS is VFA 125. The old Rough Raiders that were former former F 18 uh, A B C D rag uh, is now stood back up again. Uh, they they were stood up initially under a Strike Fighter Wing Pacific, but they split off uh, the wing to make a Joint Strike Fighter Wing and Joint and uh, Strike Fighter Wing. So the Hornet, there's two wings, type wings at Lemoore today. That Lemoore is currently the hub of all Navy F-35 operations. Uh, the, the FRS was the, obviously the core to start. We have uh, three squadrons stood up. Uh, we have uh, two deployments under our belt uh, with two of the squadrons, VFA-147 and 97. So one and of those was uh, on Lincoln with CAG-9. That was actually the MFA-314. because oh, the that's third, right. That was the... That's right. Yeah. The third squadron, the third operational squadron is a Marine squadron. Marine they actually have, they yeah. have two F-35C squadrons now with a third one coming online. One's at Miramar and one's at Cherry Point. Okay. So they're starting to move toward the East Coast. Uh, and then we, the, the Navy has their three squadrons, four squadrons actually with the RAC. Uh, and... The, the, the squadron currently in stand-up now is VF-86, the Sidewinders. Uh, they have four jets, and they will gradually take more jets throughout the year until they get to their complement of, they will, they, they're, they're, a, they're all 14 plane squadron, so we'll see how long it takes them to get that based on our delivery. That's on Lockheed. We are starting to deliver airplanes. And then they're the Navy's fourth squadron, operational squadron, uh, will start stand-up next year as, as, as VFA-86 gets their full complement of aircraft. Okay. So, so how many aircraft are you producing for the Navy, delivering to the Navy every year? Uh, it, it varies based on the buy rates that come out of the, with the budget and N98's uh, uh, what they fund for. Uh, and, and that goes back and forth based on, you know, what the appropriators appropriate, what the authorizers authorize. And we, we follow that very closely. Uh, there's some give and take there. We have the capacity to actually produce up to 30 F-35Cs per year. We haven't gotten that rate yet. We're not sure we'll get there, but we couldn't do that if, if asked. Right now, we're, uh, we're up around 18, 19 a year. That's what their plan is. They'll probably come back a little bit and go back up again. And based on the budget, based on uh, what the, other, the overall tow allows us to do, we, are, we know we're in competition. All of aviation's in competition with other warfare areas like subsurface surface. Yeah. Uh, and we, we follow it very closely to find out what our part of that tow will be. And then we deliver to desirements by the Navy and then the Joint Program Office that we're contracting to deliver. Uh, so. And the final production line, you put the F-35s together in Fort Worth? In Fort Worth. The, there, there are actually, we call that final assembly and checkout. There are actually three FACOs. Uh, we have the major, the, our, our FACO in Fort Worth, where we bring in components from around the world, around the country. We have suppliers in at least, I think it's like 49 states that produce parts for the F-35. All countries involved in the F-35 have some level of participation. Our partners are full on in from the get-go of the program where they are actually producing major components, wing components, uh, 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 wiring harnesses, boxes, uh, uh, the tail, tail hook assembly for the C, for example. Major ports that are built by, by the Netherlands. 
So, is that right? Oh yeah, oh yeah. It's it's, it's Fokker uh, okay. is is one of our major suppliers and partners in this program from an industry standpoint. Yeah. And again, there's others. Uh, so it's truly an international airplane, and we're very heavily reliant on on the international participation when we 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 bring them out of the program. Are other countries buying F thirty five Cs, or is it all A's and B's? It's all A's and B's on the international side. There was some discussion for a while about the Brits wanting to consider the F thirty five C. Uh, they did not ultimately do it. Uh, right now, it's only the U.S. Navy, uh, because you know, if you if you talk about buying an airplane, cost per pound, roughly, it's not absolute, but uh, the, the, it's the biggest airplane. But it also, in a lot of cases, the most capable because it has the largest amount of fuel, the largest endurance, uh, or, or the, the most endurance of uh, any of the variants out there. And I won't give you numbers for right now, but the bottom line, it's a very capable aircraft, flies very well, bigger wing, uh, so it's a, it's a little beefier. Yeah, because of the, the the requirement for ship suitability and landing and takeoff McCarry that you're you're familiar with. Yeah. Uh, so, but but it also has the payload has a significant payload in terms of weapons. I mean, I'm an old A6 guy. This thing carries more weight-wise ordnance than an A6 can carry. Really? Oh yeah. It's right. it's 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 good. It's it's BB, and that's a combination of internal weapons bays yeah. and the wing station. So, but people don't realize we actually can put a lot of weapons on the wing and load it up. We need to. So, so that's really significant. Yeah. I had I had no idea because yep. I remember, you know, being in an F-18 squadron as a squadron sure. AI. Right. And there was some of that back in the 80s. You know, there was this, the A-6 guys were always sort of giving, you know, razzing the F-18 guys for yeah. the, okay. the difference in payload capacity, yeah. right? How many bombs you could carry right. versus the Hornet. And I know the Super Hornet is uh, much more than the Legacy Hornet. But to hear you say that F-35C... Yeah. Uh, Exceeds the capacity of the old it does. A6. It does. That's impressive. Yeah, it is. It's been, it, it, and not, not a lot of people realize that uh, it, it. The airplane was. I'm going to use the term overbuilt. The engineers would probably, you know, the engineers say, "I don't say it like that." But I'm, I'm not the aeronautical engineer, structural yeah. engineer. But I've learned a lot by talking to a lot of smart people. But basically, the plane has been overbuilt to, to handle a lot. And no respect to that, by the way. Right. It was. It, it, it can handle a lot of external and internal stores. Now, we are limited, obviously, like any bay is by size and, and, sure. and, and, and capacity and volume, but it's pretty impressive what that airplane can carry internally. And by the way, the Air Force version, the A variant, and the C variant have roughly the same ordnance carrying capacity, uh, similar, similar capacity as spec, similar bay arrangements of okay. the same type of ordnance internal. Yeah. But so. the, the F-35C, the Navy variant, slightly bigger wing and, and fuel capacity? Yes. Just yes. because of the, yeah, the need to take off from a carrier and come back? Okay. Yep, we have we have a um, we have a little bit bigger. We, we have our wingspan is larger. It's eight feet larger, four feet either side. Okay. And that's where the fold is yeah. for the C, obviously for, you know, work on the carrier, on the carrier deck. Uh, we actually have a little different, higher and wider control services for our tail and our vertical tail. The U.S. had really firm handling qualities, slow speed behind the uh, boat. Behind the boat. Okay. So, and, and very good flight performance off the catapult as well. So it's a, it's a, it, the, all the pilots who fly all three variants in the early days, even now, some who do fly all three variants, yep. say that the, the the C is the most stable of the of the of the three. But a pilot who's an A qualified pilot can jump into a C and fly it. Uh, nice. With little little spin up because it's basically the same airplane, the control laws are pretty close. Yeah. Uh, now the B is a little different because you have the ability to do a short takeoff yeah. and do a uh, vertical yeah. landing. Yeah. 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 So yeah. it's we don't typically. You know, and the Marines will tell you they don't do vertical takeoffs because uh, they, they they generally don't need to uh, because it's, it's it's a fuel burner and you need a lot of consumption of fuel for that. Yeah. But they can they can the the, the impressive. Takeoff spec of that airplane off a short runway or a short ship is really it's, it's eye watering. Yeah. So, it, 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 um, so I talked to a couple of guys who were waiting uh, to start the F-35 fleet replacement squadron right uh, out there at Lemoore. Yep. And they said uh, right now they're sort of backed up because of a software deployment or yes. something like that. Yes. Tr three. Tr three. Same thing we were talking about earlier. Yeah. The, the the way it's, it's it's working right now is we we're getting through some of the software maturity issues. We are now starting to deliver. 
and the airplanes that we are delivering to them are all going to VFA 125, which oh, will plus the up their stable. Okay. Yeah. okay, and they in turn are helping because they're, the, the, the airplanes for the next stand-up squad are coming from 125. So it's basically we got to have airplanes to train, but we got airplanes to transition with VF 86, which is okay. the squad I'm currently in transition. Students, so we've got to get those airplanes to them. That's why they're the priority. Okay. And at the wing level, and we work very closely with the Commodore out there. I mean, we, we talk regularly, almost almost weekly. Yeah. Uh, we, we have to give him the capacity to train students and transition squadrons at the same time. So that's where the software maturity has impacted him, and we are very quickly going to overcome that, and then we'll start seeing a, what I will call in later this year and well into 25, a plethora of jets. We, like I said, I, told, I think I told you earlier, we're talking about delivering up to 41 F-35Cs across Navy and Marine Corps in 2025. That is double the number, more than double the number that we've ever delivered in F-35C, and that's because just jets are, are being built, they're ready to go, but we have the capacity to do that, and that's the current plan. Yeah. It's going to be a tall order, but uh, we think we're going to get pretty doggone close to that, not nail it. Low observable aircraft. Yes, sir. Right? Yep. And uh, we all know that uh, operating on an aircraft carrier, <laughs> operating in uh, salt, <laughs> oh, in yeah. the salt air, uh, there's a, you know, corrosion problems are a big issue for any airplane. Sure. Uh, how are the how's the LO material holding up, and how's the ability to repair that or to maintain it on a carrier underway in that environment? That's a great question. A lot of people ask that all the time because there's the skeptics are out there because of sure. the harsh environment. We all we all you and I are familiar with that. Uh, the airplane was built. The coatings were designed. The seals, the the the, the, the what I call the discontinuities. Uh, where you have panels and you have wings and you have leading yep. edge flaps, trailing edge flaps, and where we would minimize the possibility of water intrusion, the plane was built. All my, all variants were built with that, with that in mind. Yes. Okay. Uh, and the obviously the the Marine Corps, the Navy, and our our, our sister, you know, our allied services or uh, uh, services around the world who operate carriers like our our British, you know partners yeah. and like the Spanish who will eventually operate it as well. The Japanese were gearing up for the same thing. Uh, they they will deal with the same issues. But again, the plane was designed for that environment. Now, does that mean it's perfect? You know, water goes everywhere at sea. You're familiar with that. But yeah. and, and, and with rain and salt spray and even in, we found down in other countries like uh, that, that, that border uh, very humid environments like Australia, because they, they, they operate the F-35A yep. as well. They're as worried about it as, as your, our Navy and Marine Corps brethren are. But we've, we've got the, the, the resiliency of the system, we call it, is very, very high. What we're finding is it's holding up very well. And we've done a lot of testing in very harsh environments before we even started this to put the right system on the airplane to absorb and operate and survive corrosion and maintain the the LO capabilities of the aircraft operating in that environment. So I can't go into details of it here, sure. but it's it's unlike anything that's ever been put on an airplane that are currently quote LO. Yep. Uh, and we've also trained the maintainers. Now they're still wor learning a lot about it, but our bigger corrosion uh, items we, we watch on the airplane are the th same things you have with legacy airplanes, like it's a Hornet or a E-2 or a Hilo, is any uh, area where that water, that humidity, that dust, that particulate matter can set up a con conductive environment where you have either dissimilar metal corrosion. I mean, we're, we're no different. We, we are sealed better. Yeah. We've, we've done some things to make it make it better than legacy. But we still have to do corrosion inspections. We still have to do the periodic uh, inspections to, to go through the airplane and make sure we preserve the long-term life of the airplane because they're going to be around for quite a while, and you want to make sure you're preserving the force. Yeah. And I'll tell you, a lot of that, I'm going to give credit to our, our Hornet brethren uh, at Lemoore and, and in Airland, Airpac. Uh, they have been a major part of saying we've taken lessons learned from the legacy communities and we folded that into the F-35 community and say, let's make sure we stay ahead of this one early and not assume because it's a brand new airplane, we don't have any issues with it. Um, so the Navy is doing a great job of maintaining their F-35s in that regard and developing programs that are literally uh, type leading programs to work corrosion. 
At the same time, we fall back very heavily on our Air Force partners who have a lot of experience in LO maintainability. Got so it. it's a it's a yeah. it's a team sport. And our and the Navy Marine Corps and the Air Force, and then expand that out to the partners and the few uh, foreign military sales customers, we're all sharing those lessons. Yeah. So again, we'll find we'll find goods and others with the airplane in that regard. But I'm very confident based on what I've seen. I've been doing this directly with the fleet now for over 15 years. They get it, and they're they're embracing it, and uh, they'll be fine with it. So uh, anyone who's served on an aircraft carrier is familiar, you know, watching uh, a young maintainer, a brown shirt, whatever, oh, yeah. walking around the top of an airplane, <laughs> out on the wing route, et cetera, right? Would you not see that on an F-35 on a, on a carrier? No, you'd see it. We, we designed, we, 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 we've designed, you know, the, the, the boots to wear for it. They're little, you know, booties you put on when you okay. walk up. Yep. They don't always do that. But I'll, I will tell you a little vignette. When we were developing the airplane, and we still have that thing today, we actually took, as part of the assessment of the, 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 the resiliency of the airframe, the external airframe, including the LO yep. system, was we actually built two-spec LO panels, and we made them doormats. Huh. And we would have people walk into the hangar and scrape your feet on the doormat and walk around yep. and put many more hits on that panel uh, as it was built. And periodically, we, we record them all. It, there was a counter, literally, that counted the, and we actually did it on carriers as well. We actually put some of the initial material on F-18s, and they flew for deployments in places that were very vulnerable to dings and damages that you typically see on a carrier. Huh. And we would take them off and measure them. And we, we actually brought airplanes back, and the Navy drove this, by the way, to their credit. Yeah. We brought airplanes back from the first deployments. We, they maintained them, not us. We would help them if they needed help. Yeah. But they maintained them. We brought them back to our, what we call our acceptance test facility at Fort Worth that every single F-35 produced goes through to measure its signature. Yeah. And we remeasured the airplanes after their first deployment. We're going to do it again and validate the fact that even with, the, you know, with the new car coming out of the, 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 the car dealership, yeah. comes back in for a service check, we're going to measure it, its signature, and the initial uh, time we did that two years ago said, they're fine. Huh. Yeah. Wow. That's yeah. impressive. That's and impressive. All, of the, all of the measurements are based on what we considered modeled end-of-life measurements, and they're exceeding it. So that, that's it's great. a good news story. Great, great. Last question I, I have for you. Uh, so you, career Navy commanded an aircraft carrier, got out, yep. went into business, went into industry, Lockheed Martin, et cetera. Uh, what did you uh, not expect that you found in industry or vice versa? What are some lessons? What, what advice would you give for somebody who's coming to the end of their Navy career and uh, looking to go into industry? You know, goods and others? Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. First of all, what I found out, the first thing was obvious to me, that all the companies have very high ethical standards. They did. I mean, they're like any other community. You're going to have 99% are going to be great people. There's a 1% that sometimes, you know, will push the envelope a little bit when they should. But I, 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 one of the things that attracted me to Lockheed, other than the fact it was in Texas where I wanted to move to, was the fact that I got to the company within a couple of days of going through the onboarding process. I realized the ethical standard they maintain, and they all do. I mean, there's the, they, they all – we. All of our competitors, I call them, are the same way. Competitors. Yeah, like yeah, it. they're all because we work together. I mean, sure. we, we we have competition. We yeah. we rib each other. But you know, the, most of the folks who work in this industry who, who work with the military are ex-military themselves. The, the goal is to deliver a war fighting capability because we all came from being war fighters. Yeah. That's the good, and and you'll see that throughout the industry. The 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 other one of the major others is, it's just the acquisition process, whether it's on the government side or the. The industry side is just so doggone long to deliver from. I got a capability I need to, or a gap I need to fill, so it drives a requirement. You got to go through the the, the typical budgeting process, yep. which can be long and laborious. Requirements and oh yeah, oh yeah. yeah. And then finally, when you say I want a widget, a platform, a box, a card that does this, to get that delivered to the warfighter that needs it today or yesterday. It can be a very long and onerous process, and we have, and everybody agrees this. There's the, this is not new news. Yeah. If we can find a way to expedite that to protect these young men and women who are taking these airplanes in harm's way, I think that's we collectively as a community, whether I'm Lockheed, Boeing, uh, Raytheon, and the hundreds of other great companies out there working with 
the government to get them capability faster. Is it, you know, consistency of a demand signal? What are some of the things? Because this is something that in proceedings, uh, we're, we're doing a look at this. We're, we're going to put some of our focus in the next year on acquisition, on how do, yep. we, how do we solve some of the problems, getting things faster to the fleet through that requirements process, through that onerous acquisition process. How do, how do you break those barriers down, right? So you've seen it from I, both sides. Yeah. You know, if there was one bit of advice that you might throw out, what would it be? That's a multi-answer question. <laughs> so to pin it down to one, it's, just, it's hard. I, okay. I think... I think the biggest thing is we have to be able to expedite the contracting process. Now, I used to be a Navy guy, and I would always complain about, I, how can it take so long? It's like I'm doing now. Yeah. But at the same time, I think I think the the industry really does have good intentions, but they're also an industry. Yeah. And I'm going to use a term that a retired four-star laid on me one time. It's a business. It's not religion. Yeah. So we are we are a we are profit-based. However, that profit goes back into redesigning capabilities, into research and development, into infrastructure improvements that all pay back to the, 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 the customer. And I, I don't like using that word. It's the war fighters yeah. who need the capability. Right. We have to find a better uh, amount of give and take between the, 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 the government and industry to make that delivery of her faster just talked about. It's, I don't know what the right answer is going to be. I'm not going to talk about profit sharing within the organization. I don't want to go into those details because I'm not as smart as I need to be on it, to yep. be fair. But I do know the warfighter needs should weigh in more. Now, I said business, not religion. Maybe we can put a little more religion into the business. That would be nice to have across the defense industrial base. Okay. But they still have to make money because that's how, that's how they keep moving forward, better technologies. Yeah, and, and you don't stay in business if you don't make money. No, you don't. You don't. Yeah, it's, you don't. Yeah, but I think there's a false notion out there that we're 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 raking in money hand over foot. Um, yeah, we're making profit because that's how you stay in business. Right. But not as much as you would see from some of the magazine articles. I mean, we're we're doing okay. We'd have to, or we wouldn't be doing it. Right. But again, I, I go back to a little bit of religion in the business is okay. To, to say it's for the American, it's for American national security and for the warfighters on the front end. Well, uh, my guest has been an old shipmate, uh, Captain Retired, Jim Gigliotti. He's the uh, F-35C yep. program manager uh, for the Navy. Jim, uh, great to see you as always. Always. Thanks for stopping by. Yeah, I'm glad we finally got this knocked out. That was I, good. I agree. Thanks for, yeah, thanks yeah, for, yeah. Thanks for making right. me do this. I really enjoyed it. Until next episode, remember, victory begins at the Naval Institute.